Welcome to Electron Line. Now we're going to learn about the parallel axis theorem as it applies to the second moment of area, which when we replace the area by the mass, we get the moment of inertia. So that's why we're going to find the parallel axis theorem relative to the moment of inertia, which is the same as saying the second moment of area if we use area instead of mass. Now the equation reads as follows. The moment of inertia relative to some axis is going to be equal to the moment of inertia of that object relative to its center of mass plus the area of the object times the distance squared that you move the object away from its original position. For example, here we've placed this square right so that the center mass is right on the x-axis. So we can find the moment of inertia of the square relative to the x-axis with the of course a square with the center mass right on the axis. Then when we move it a certain distance, notice that we moved it from the center mass being on the axis to the center mass now being a distance of a over 2 away. So the distance in this case is going to be a over 2. And here you can see that the distance that we moved the square, distance now here is going to be 3 halves a. And we're going to calculate the moment of inertia in each case, starting with the first one, then we find the moment of inertia of this, and the moment of inertia of that, using the parallel axis, the parallel axis theorem. We're going to use a reference for this one, because we can actually calculate it using integration, and we'll show you later how to do that, or we can go back to this and realize that the moment of inertia of a rectangle, which is bordering an axis, is equal to one-third the width of the rectangle times the height of the rectangle cubed. Realizing that the width times the height is the area of the rectangle, we can factor that out, and this can be written as one-third the area of the rectangle times h squared, that's the distance from the axis to the top part of the rectangle. Now, looking over here, we have two rectangles that are equal in size. This rectangle here has a height a over 2 and a width a, and an area, of course, that would be one-half a squared. We have another rectangle right here, and therefore, that is exactly the same as that. So therefore, we can say that i, the moment of inertia relative to the x-axis, is equal to two times, because we have two of these rectangles, the moment of inertia of each of the two rectangles, which would be one-third times the width, which is a, times the height of the rectangle cubed, and the height of the rectangle would be a over 2. This distance b here is a over 2. So we could say a over 2 quantity cubed. All right, so what does that look like? So i sub x is equal to, that would be 2 thirds a times a cubed over 8, because 2 cubed is 8. So we have a 2 here, we have an 8 there, the 2 cancels with the 8, that becomes 4. And so this therefore becomes i relative to the x-axis, the moment of inertia relative to the x-axis is going to be 1 twelfth a to the 4th power. All right, and that's of course what we'd expect it to be. Now let's go over to the next one, now that we have moved the, the uh, square, a distance d equals to half the side of a square. So using the parallel axis theorem, we can now say that the moment of inertia in this case is going to be equal to the moment of inertia we found when we placed the center mass on the axis, like we did over here. And I guess we should make it, this is the moment of inertia relative with the center mass on the axis. And then we go plus the area times d squared. So let's see what that becomes equal to, and notice that that's actually a very nice handy equation which can be used many times when we start finding the moment of inertia of all kinds of objects or summation of objects, maybe like a, sh a different kind of shaped object where we can recognize squares and rectangles and so forth that are offset from a certain distance from the center mass being on the axis and we can then find the moment of inertia using this very nice technique. So the way this works so this is equal to the moment of inertia of the center mass, 1 twelfth a to the fourth power plus the area of that square, which is a squared, times the distance that we moved it squared. We moved the distance of a over 2. And we need to square that. 
So this becomes equal to 1 12th, 8 to the 4th, plus, that would be 1 4th times 8 to the 4th, and 1 12th plus 1 4th, well, the common factor, or the common denominator, I should say, is uh, 12. So this is equal to 1 12th, 8 to the 4th, plus 3 12 8 to the 4th, that would be 4 twelfths or 1 third a to the 4th. So that's 4 over 12, 1 third a to the 4th. So this would be the moment of inertia of the same square when we move a distance d equal to a over 2 as opposed to 1 twelfth a over 4. Now we're going to move it a distance of 3 over 2a. So the new moment of inertia is going to be equal to the moment of inertia of the center mass situation right here. This is 1 12th a to the fourth plus the area a squared times the distance moved which is 3 over 2a and we have to square that. So this is equal to 1 12th a to the fourth plus that would be 9 over 4 a to the fourth and of course, the common denominator here would be 12. That would be equal to 1 12th, a to the fourth, plus this would be 27 over 12, a to the fourth, which is 28 over 12, a to the fourth. And we can divide both the numerator and the denominator by, hmm, by 4. So this would be equal to 7 thirds, a to the fourth. And notice how nice that parallel axis theorem works. Once you know the moment of inertia of an object with the center mass at the origin, so about the center mass, we can then find the moment of inertia of the very same object displaced from that location in any amount, in any direction, and we can easily find the moment of inertia of that situation. And that's how it's done.